Premier Honorable Toketalangi has confirmed $60,000 will be injected into pay packets next week with the new salary increase to public servant salaries. However, the change is not as simple as 10 and 15% increase. Depends on whether you earn $20,000 or less than $20,000 per annum. The increase will be based on a unified salary scale for different workers. A government make the changes. School leavers are also about to receive extra perks as government move to improve remuneration in line with New Zealand teachers. Honourable Premier Tokitalangi said after the prize-giving ceremony at Newey High School well, this week, the two principals of Newey High School and Newey Primary School will look at more than $30,000 to bring closer the gap of remuneration with expatriates. He said teachers have four different pay rates, one rate for expats from Australia and New Zealand, one for expats from the region, one for expats living in Niue and one for local teachers. The long-standing arguments by local teachers who hold the same qualifications as some expats will sure welcome the change by the government. However, five teachers from New High School said farewell to students this week as they bid the island farewell. Eight contractual posts were received from the New Public Service Commission to advertise for New High School and three for New Primary School. Other changes for the new, new amendment of the income and new consumption tax. Dependent children are also expected to benefit as the $26 tax rebate on de dependent children is proposed to increase to $500 or $1,000. That, says Honourable Tokatahalangi, will take place at the end of the tax year. The tax rebate of $2,000 announced in the change has also is proposed to receive $38 a fortnight for those in the private sector earning less than $20,000 a fortnight. That is about to take place next week. The changes, says Premier Talangi, will benefit families as government push to encourage people to continue living on the island. New Year's former police chief Ross Ardern arrived on the island last week on a short stop as part of New Zealand Police's coordinating program to assist and offer assistance to its personnel established in different parts of the Pacific Island, as well as discuss avenues to develop the relationship. The visit to New Zealand's Superintendent Ardern is to look at plans for the New Zealand Police sector. Chief Kennery's uh, role will finish here in uh, August next year. Uh, New Zealand Police, along with uh, the agencies that we work with in the New Zealand Government, will be looking for a seamless transition from Chief Chinnery uh, to whatever the Government of Niue might decide that they want uh, in terms of future policing prospects for Niue. And uh, my role here is to uh, look at what the options are available, uh, put on the table what uh, New Zealand Police are thinking uh, about and also, of course, and most importantly, to listen to what the new Niue Government and Niue Public Service Commission uh, want from New Zealand Police, if anything at all. Well, I think at the moment that you would still need to continue to look uh, within the region for assistance for the Chief's role, but at the same time uh, I recognise that the Government of Niue is uh, looking at having Niue and heads of departments, and uh, certainly you know, if that's what the Government of Niue wants to do, uh, then we are more than willing to listen to our partners in this. Uh, so um, my Commissioner has made it clear that uh, we're willing and ready and able to assist, uh, but the decision really rests with the Government of Niue. Chief Ardern, who is now working in Samoa as New Zealand's Pacific Coordinator Superintendent, said the work environment experienced in the Pacific is uniquely different and the New Zealand Police encourages development with its staff based in many islands. Many of the training components are really quite similar. We have the same problems across the region that we have here in Niue. And uh, I'm sure that Chief Chinnery has been working very hard on the same issues that I sometimes work on across the region. Uh, sadly, across the Pacific, we have uh, alcohol acting as an aggravator in many, many areas of offending. And that's not unique uh, to Niue or to any other Pacific country. It's um, something that we need to work with and live with on a daily basis. But I think that for the Pacific region, that's one of the major problems that we have. 
The other is actually uh, all about accountability, making sure that people who put their hands up for leadership roles actually are accountable to the people that they work with and to the governments that they serve. You said about the assistance from the New Zealand police, and we know there's been um, a few officers that's been up training some of our um, officers here. Um, will that is that set to continue even if we don't have a New Zealand chief of police or Australian chief of police? Yes, it is. You know, um, New Zealand uh, has a constitutional tie to Nui, uh, and uh, the commissioner of police uh, will continue to be able to offer assistance uh, to Nui. Uh, certainly we'd never ever consider walking away from uh, Nui. And it's the same with the current situations that you have, uh, that Chief Chenery has here in Nui. I've made it very clear to the Chief uh, that New Zealand Police stand to offer whatever assistance he might request from New Zealand Police uh, to help him resolve any of the issues that he's currently investigating. That is former Nui Chief of Police Ross Ardern. Chief Ardern, as he is always remembered by many on the island, will be leaving tomorrow. We wish him and his wife Laurel all the best for Christmas and the New Year. World leaders at COP17 or Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change meeting in Durban, South Africa were presented a firm message by Nui's Premier Honourable Tokita Langi last week to take charge or leave without recognition from the high-level summit. Honourable Premier Talangi said at the meeting that he find it appalling, really appalling that leaders can't make a political decision on these matters. It's a dreadful lack of understanding of our legacy as world leaders at this moment, particularly the large countries. The politics of climate change is broken into three parts, said Premier of Niue. One is to do with the risk assessment of the information being given to us from scientists and whether it is perceived as low, medium or high. The second is in relation to risk management in terms of funding. And the third is to do with the legacy of leaders at the moment with our respect to make decisions on climate change or not. The Premier feels that some of the developed countries view the risk assessment as medium, allowing for more time to continue the negotiations whereas others view the risk assessment as high. It is its inability to agree that delays our outcome. Continuing to disagree with the climate change problem grows worse and nothing is done. The point needed to be made about the fact that this is uh, down the reasons why I went to, to Durban was to uh, provide my inputs as a political leader of this world at the present time. And my concerns were the fact that we were starting to mix up the negotiations for individual countries um, with the, the key elements that we needed to, to agree on politically, and that's the reduction in carbon emissions and therefore the reduction in temperatures, that, that, that thing. Um, what, what has happened is that political leaders over the past many years have abdicated the responsibilities to, in fact, take action. And that's the point that I made. And I said this, it's... It, it, it's uh, an appalling situation that these people have been allowed to continue in this manner while the world is dying because we're poisoning it. And uh, out, of the, out of the many leaders of the, of the world at the present moment, we form the cabinet of the world. You know, whether you're from a large country or a small country, it doesn't really matter. I don't see myself as coming from a, necessarily from a small country. I come from an island which encompasses all the Z that we have, which is equivalent to about 400,000 uh, square kilometres. And that's a lot of earth, if you wish, that we're responsible for. So therefore, I see my position as espousing our desire for us to stop poisoning the world and reducing carbon emissions. Um, and it's our responsibilities as leaders of the world at the present time to deal with that. It's not, it's not, we, we essentially are abdicating our responsibilities. In other words, we're not assuming the responsibilities if we have as world leaders to make some hard decisions on this. What has happened in Durban is that they've agreed that to a roadmap which by 2020 will determine a framework, a legal framework for carbon emissions. By that time, some of the island countries around the world will have sunk below. Uh, 
below the sea because the sea level rise. So in, in essence, we and I see the, if you like, an assessment of what the scientists and, the, and our officials are telling me and telling us as, as political leaders at this moment, the risk is extremely high. Therefore, we've got to respond to it now, not wait until 2020. The fact that they, they seem to feel that 2020 seems to be a suitable time seems to imply to me the fact that they believe that um, the risk is not, not high, it's medium. Uh, which is, in my mind, a lot of nonsense, really. But, you know, I'm, I'm happy that the, the, the speech that I made has been used by journalists around the world as a basis for uh, uh, advancing the views that we have in the Pacific, as well as the views that many of the world leaders in, around the world have with regard to climate change. It is the biggest danger that we face and the biggest risk that we face at the present moment with our world. There's nothing else. Do you believe that Australia and New Zealand being, being I guess, the gateway into the Pacific should have voiced more at the, uh, at the conference in South Africa? I, I think they have. And, it, and you've got to accept the fact that the Australians, for example, have just imposed a uh, carbon tax. And that's part of an individual country's responsibility. We're not, whatever the country does with respect to reducing the carbon emissions, whether it's by green economy, by use of technology, by tax, uh, or by uh, carbon, carbon emissions um, trading, is entirely up to them. But the key element of what we're trying to do is to decide on reduction in carbon emissions. That's, that's what we make a decision on. And once we make a decision on Every country can do whatever they, they wish to do to ensure that they meet those particular targets, whatever, they, whatever we have agreed. And I had hoped, in fact, that we would have agreed in Durban to, uh, to uh, a legal framework that we can use as from 2012. But we didn't. We agreed, in fact, to delay the decision until 2020, which is, in some respects, for many of island countries like Tuvalu, Kiribati and, and so on, maybe too late. The Alliance of Small Island States also called on for a Durban mandate to negotiate a new protocol under the Climate Convention by 2012 with ambitious mitigation goals consistent with holding warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. New York Primary School and the Early Childhood Education held their annual prize giving ceremony on Monday with most anxious parents rewarded with their children's achievement throughout the academic year. The joyous event took place at the Millennium Hall with plenty of entertainment for those who joined the prize-giving ceremony. Early childhood education sector distributed their ex acknowledgments, announcing a few of the students that are about to take the road to New Primary School in the new year. However, the most anticipated moment arrived with the student who is to become the Ducks for New York Primary School. The honours this year was received by Tewila Nosa of Avaseli. Congratulations to Tewila Nosa and all of the students of New York Primary School and Early Childhood Education. New York High School prize giving was held on Tuesday morning. We'll continue with that report. New York High School held their prize giving ceremony on Tuesday with much ex expectations of who the school ducks will go to. As many parents and families attend the annual event, the prize giving started with Year 7 students to Year 13. An acknowledgement of achievements by teachers also who have continued their studies as well was received. However, news that five teachers will not return in 2012 was somber for students as they bid farewell. But the most anticipated moment arrived and the Ducks for 2011 was presented to Master Jordan Hacker of Alofi North. Congratulations to Jordan Hacker and all of the students. We wish Jordan and all the, all the best in the future, as well as those students leaving Newey High School. The day for Newey High School ended with the annual rugby match between previous students of the school and those still attending. A valiant effort to topple the school leavers' domination of end-of-year rugby competition with New High School did not go to plan as the annual event had many attend.
However, the leaders claim victory by a hair as one point sealed the fate of the students. Miss Fiji Alisi Rambunga Waga has won the title of Miss South Pacific 2011-2012 held in Samoa on Saturday night. The popular title was won by a 24-year-old who competed with eight other countries for the prestigious Pacific title. Ms. Rapu Kawanga took over the title for Ms. Cook Islands' Joanna Maya. The first runner-up, Ms. Hawaiian Islands' Kawina Sousa, followed by Ms. Tonga Lipati Afiaki. Second runner-up, third runner-up, Ms. Papua New Guinea Sarah Kilakaro. And fourth runner-up, Ms. Cook Islands' Yuyangi Bishop. Niwe held the prestigious title in 2005 with Miss Sina Hemana Hiko and in 2008 by Miss Vanessa Marsh. Old folks around the island gathered at the New Zealand High Commission's residence yesterday for their annual Christmas party. The event that started in 1992 by Father Clover of the Catholic Mission to show appreciation for the elderly. We send along our young reporter Katrina Melikitama to speak to one of the facilitators. The program is, is just bringing, you know, it's just showing our um, senior citizens um, a respect for them and also a tribute to what they used to do when they were young because they built this place new way and they really had a, a very hard time in the old days. So it is part of that too and also just to make them feel that we remember them. And uh, they, you know, they're more important in the community as well. So who, who was um, the mastermind behind all this? Well, the mastermind was Father Clover. He was a priest, um, came here in 1991, and he started this program in 1992, and it is an ongoing. So... We, we keep it going since he passed away about 15 years ago. And um, so it is an ongoing program for our church, for our community. Uh, how do you make of the reactions of um, all the, the elders that, that come to this program? Oh, they look forward to during the year. And sometimes they don't want to go home after. They, you know, they really want to stay and carry on. Um, they all look forward, even the younger ones, that ask why aren't they invited and uh, because they're not of age. But sometimes, you know, I uh, give them an invitation to come because they really want to come. Yeah. What are your thoughts for all the elders out there that didn't make it? Well, I wish them, you know, I wish them all the best of Christmas and the New Year and I just wish they all, yeah. <laughs> They all be here next year, and and those who are in the hospital couldn't come. My love to them. Thank you very much. We wish all our old folks a wonderful Christmas and a joyous New Year. That's our news bulletin for tonight. Good evening.